Hello Mzanzi and welcome to episode 213 of Farmer's Inside Track. I'm your host, Dawn Mdu. Biologist and fly farmer, Arnay Farhoof's fondest childhood memories were made visiting the local zoo where he grew up in Pretoria and behind books reading about insects. He teases to say he chose entomology because he likes to bug people. <laughs> In this edition, we get to chat to him about his work as Chief Technology Officer at Nambu, an insect protein company, and more about his career in agriculture. Arne, it's such a pleasure to have you here with me on Farmers Inside Track. We met some time ago, and I've been able to pick your brain on a lot of things. And this time around, I get to know you a little bit better. So the person behind your research, your work in agriculture, and also more about what you do in this space. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Dawn. Actually been great connecting with you in the past, and I'm very excited. Yeah, definitely. So I usually like to ask most of my guests to share some of their childhood memories, where they grew up, just more about life with family and the people that you love. I grew up at dodgy parts of Pretoria, in Pretoria North. I come from, a, I suppose, what one would consider a multicultural house. I mean, we weren't particularly well off, but uh, there was definitely a lot of love and support in the house. I was definitely allowed to explore all my curiosity. A dad that taught me how to fight for what I want, and a mom that definitely supported her very weird son. I spent a lot of time be volunteering at the zoo, Pretoria Zoo. And I spent most of my weekends and school holidays there. And I think that's probably my favorite memories were made there, working with all the weird and wonderful animals. And the rest of the time, I basically just spent poring over books, biology books, everything from breeding aquarium fish to the lizards of the world. My childhood was very biologically geared. <laughs> Do you think that this is where the start of this pursuit of this specific career that you're in, you sort of set up in a way that because you were so involved with this and that it became sort of your passion and your love that led you to agriculture and what you do today? It started off with just a love for animals since I have any memories and subsequently just broadened from there into the whole biological world. And then, of course, agriculture intrinsically part of the world. Every field is an ecosystem in and of itself. And it sounds absolutely amazing. I mean, I wish I had visited to the zoo as a child <laughs> growing up as often as you did, but it does sound really amazing, Arne. So thank you so much for sharing that and hats off to your parents for that as well. Your focus is specifically on entomology, right? So what do you love most about what you do and why do you do it? I am an entomologist because I'm good at bugging people. <laughs> Insects are a great way to understand the natural world. They are intrinsically part of the natural world and they're very useful in discovering patterns and processes in the natural world. And as I have a particular fondness for plants, insects also provide a lot of insight into plants and their cultivation because they've evolved together for hundreds of millions of years. So it's not that I have a particular fascination or interest in insects, but they are just a very useful tool in studying the natural world. And then of course, they're gonna, they are becoming very useful in addressing our impact on the world. You're currently with Nambu. Maybe you can talk to us just more about the work that you're doing as the Chief Technology Officer and maybe more of your career highlights and a bit about the journey that you've been on, you know, as an entomologist. After leaving university, I had a, did several projects just maintaining insect cultures for other projects. There's something I always had an interest in, but I briefly explored the, the cannabis industry. When we moved down to the Eastern Cape, I was looking for something to do outside of the cannabis industry and met with Lowell Scar, who is the founder of Number Group, and he was looking to set up a new facility in East London. So it was very fortuitous that we actually connected with each other. And then June last year, we started the East London facility. And I've been heading the operations this side. This is the first commercial scale facility of uh, Number Group, the other facility being in Makanda. 
So I've been exploring black soldier flies in particular, their cultivation, trying to optimize producing black soldier flies, and then processing, which is currently taking up a lot of my focus in the company, how to actually keep the maggots after harvest in order for them to enter the conventional feed systems. I think I'm just recalling a conversation that we had on this podcast with Professor Abdullahi on this topic. And I know it's really interesting and I'm sure you can talk more about your work and research, but I'd like to for a moment focus on the work that you did before in the cannabis and hemp space. Tell us more about this. I came across an interesting article about an initiative that you were part of with Stockfell and NACOR foundation maybe you can talk to us more about this work i've had a interesting relationship with cannabis it definitely helped me early on in my life from a therapeutic point of view i quickly discovered just how useful the cannabis plant can be and so subsequently have done work in america several countries in europe spoken at conferences in asia and also wrote several articles about the hemp industry I guess my fascination with cannabis and hemp was just because there's a lot of old, new, old plants and principles that we can incorporate to solve some of our new problems. And cannabis is really good in this regard, although there's plenty of other candidates out there, sort of a flagship. So I have done a lot of work in cannabis, predominantly focused on industrial hemp. But it's an industry that's uh, just fraught with mainly bureaucratic challenges. And so they say there's a perpetual imminence. The big breakthrough is always around the corner. So I've uh, taken a step back from it because there are all these equal candidates that can address what hemp can address without the narcotics conventions and the... Know, local and international bureaucracy associated with cannabis in particular. The NACO Foundation, I have to commend, they do a lot for industrial hemp worldwide, specifically focused in Europe. That's just bringing broader awareness to the plant and its uses and also to people doing interesting things with the plant, all the key players. But I'm definitely very thankful for NACO and for Hemp Today because they gave me a lot of opportunities as I was trying to find my own feet in the cannabis industry. It sounds like you've had a very you know, interesting journey in the space. And I think it's so inspiring just to listen to you talk about the work that you've been doing. And I would love to maybe in another session, talk more about also your research and more of these alternatives that you're talking about. Maybe just to talk more broadly around issues that we're dealing with on a more global scale, especially around food waste and it being so complex, and more specifically, your research and about how you think we could possibly solve this. And how do you also predict or think about how we will produce food in the long term and how we'll change, you know, what we eat, how we produce our food? I asked you for timelines and projections, but maybe that's not something that you can specifically talk about. I'm always so careful when I speak to researchers because everything is very scientific and data-driven. So if you could maybe just talk briefly on that, Arne. You know, there's various estimates on just how much food is actually wasted in our very complex global food system. And by all estimations, it's probably one-fifth of all food that ends up being wasted before it reaches our plates. But since being on the ground and dealing with this waste, it really has been eye-opening in a sense. Seeing a number on a piece of paper or on a screen doesn't really capture the incredible amount of food that is just wasted. A lot of times just for aesthetic reasons or a silly example, a tomato being too ripe. So when it reaches its end destination, it will be overripe. So it is discarded. Literally tons and tons and tons of food that is just dumped. And we don't have systems in place that actually deals with this waste. A lot of it just ends up in landfills where it produces greenhouse gases, methane and the CO2 principal ones. But the nutrients actually contained in this is also lost. 
in an age where agricultural inputs are, the prices are increasing on a day-to-day basis and raw materials getting more and more expensive, for example, phosphate that we mine, it's inherently unsustainable. And I hope that this food system focuses on the circularity. And I think this is where the future is headed. We are going to see not vertical integration, but rather circular integration, where we capture these wasted resources. And not just that, but prevent them from causing their own harm by just being dumped, by just rudimentary composting. So there's various ways that this will be addressed, but insects will definitely play a predominant role insects by digestion. And I think this is also on a farm level, this is becoming very important. We see the soils being degraded, every farmer exploring regenerative agriculture. And this, you know, closing the loop will be fundamental in not just keeping the cost of food down, but also solving a lot of issues that we face. I think uh, COP27 will go a long way in addressing Um, some of these issues. And once again, insects will play a large part in reaching the target set out by COP27. As far as projections, it's always dangerous asking an idealist what the projections are. But I suspect we'll see a two-pronged approach where certain parts of agriculture will be intensified, producing more food on less land, using less resources. And then on the other hand, a more extensive approach where we insert our agricultural production, where we entrench it more into natural systems, working with an ecosystem instead of fighting against it. And this is not difficult to achieve because it will also just save farmers money, which is fundamental in this time where every cent counts for farmers. I also think that we'll see more novel proteins, so insect proteins for food and feed, and less reliance on things like fish meal, which is by all accounts incredibly damaging to the oceans and in turn to our survival on this little planet of ours. Thank you, Arne. I think you've really been able to respond to that one holistically, giving us all the aspects and things to consider. So thank you so much for taking a shot and responding with your knowledge and experience on that specific question. Thank you so much. We're nearing the end of our discussion, and I love asking this question to all of my guests. And it's specifically around what message that you'd give Arne from five years ago. And if you're listening to this podcast in 10 years time, what would you say to your future self, inshallah? For Arne five years ago... I would say that never let go of your idealism, but focus on the job at hand. Incremental improvements will pay off better than being dismayed at the state of this world. And for my future self, I would just like to give a high five, first of all, for getting his act together. Oh, I love it. (laughs) But, (laughs) But secondly, I would be a little bit more stern and uh, say that you better have your food forest than actual forest. It was such a pleasure chatting to you, Arne Farouf, Chief Technology Officer at Nambu. I can't wait to catch up again soon. Next up, and before we let you go, we meet this week's hashtag soil sister, farmer Silungile Ndlovu. She talks more about her amazing journey in agriculture, more about life on the farm, highlighting some of her success stories. I'm a married woman. I grew up in a small town of Richmond in KwaZulu Natal as a privileged, spoiled and favorite daughter of five siblings. We all females at home and I was raised by a widow. My dad passed away when I was three. Then my mom also passed on after my first graduation. I was first introduced to farming during my high school years in Wartburg Kirchdorf School in Wartburg, where my teacher, who had farms, used to take us to study about wetlands. It was at that time when I fell in love with farming, the setting out of the farm and the way of living. Post-metric, I pursued a career in agriculture, enrolled at Sidara College of Agriculture, 
where I obtained my diploma in agriculture. I majored in both animal and crop production. Due to my excellent academic performance, I was awarded a full bursary by Potato South Africa. During my diploma, I managed to obtain a senior certificate in sugarcane agriculture at SASRI, which is the South African Sugarcane Research Institute. I enrolled at UNISA and did my BTEC in agriculture management, where I graduated cum laude. Furthermore, I obtained a postgraduate in business management and an MBA, which is the Master's in Business Administration. I am a registered agricultural natural scientist at SACNAV, which is the South African Council for Scientist Professions. I represented South Africa and completed my seminar on agro product market development and trade cooperation management for developing countries in 2017 sponsored by the Ministry of Commerce and organized by the Center of International Cooperation Service of Ministry of Agriculture in Beijing, in China. I currently serve on various milk group boards. I met and married my loving soulmate, Dr. Sithen I met him in 2013, and then we got married 2015. My in-laws are seasoned farmers. By the time I got married, they already had four farms, which consisted of beef farming, sugarcane, and other crops. Their farms are widely spread in KZN. Under my excellent leadership skills, my husband and I have managed to maximize the production of beef head in our Virginia farm located in Boston, which is about 500 hectares in area. My husband and I manage the other farms as well. My husband and I were awarded first prize at the National Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries, which was called at the time AgriStars Recognition Awards for our success and contribution to the agricultural sector, specifically within animal and plant production. I was recognized above other young farmers from all over South Africa for my outstanding achievements as owner and managing director of Mjadia Oil Supply and Renewable Energy, a company that offers both agricultural products crop and livestock, and renewable energy products and services. Thank you so much for joining us here on Farmers Inside Track, Silungi Lendlovu. You can, of course, read more about her farming business and journey in this dynamic space on www.foodformzanzi.co.za. And that's a wrap from me, Don Numdu, our producer, Megan van der Fendt, and the rest of the Food Form Zanzi team have an absolutely amazing week. Bye for now. Life in South Africa can be a lot. I mean, scroll through Twitter for a minute and tell me I'm wrong. Thank God for South Africans though, right? We're inspiring and even on the bad days, we fight back with a smile. That's why I love Food Form Zanzi so much. They're not ashamed to celebrate the ordinary unsung heroes who work every day to put food on our nation's tables. Go to foodformzanzi.co.za and never miss an inspiring story.